Welcome to Corel Painter Sergeant vs. Master Course, an in-depth series where we will learn about the Sergeant vs. tool set and how to apply them on different subjects such as still life, portraiture, architecture and landscapes. Our classes will have a gradual level of complexity, from simple sketching to more advanced techniques. Whether you are a beginner or an advanced artist, you are welcome to stay with us. We believe there is something for everyone in this course. It's good to see you again. Now that you have tried some simple free sketching using some very basic brush mechanics in our previous class, I want you to consider that as having done a warm-up for what we are going to learn this time. Remember, before each demo or exercise, I was clear about not having any rules for applying lighting or color or any specific process. Well, the meaning with it was to give you a window to train and assess the skills you currently have in a free, intuitive way. The technique I'm going to show you is called Minimalist Realism Sketch and um, it will come to push you in an intuitive direction but in a completely organized manner. You will learn how to break down shapes, color and lighting to bring your sketches to life. I love teaching this technique, um, which I have developed a few years back, and there's a whole story behind it, as well as a much more detailed explanation on how to apply it. But since this is a course focused on a sergeant brushes and not on art theories, I recommend that you check out my in-depth class on a subject, uh, it's completely free and you will get the link by the end of this video. But to resume about it, I asked myself some years back some questions. In order to be more effective, can I think of a set of steps that I can follow and apply to most painting and sketch techniques? If so, what should these steps be? How can I structure that? So minimalist realism sketch was my answer to those questions. Take a print screen of our framework. So the basic steps I came up with was 1. Breaking down the different planes of our image or scene and always work from the furthest to the closest plane. It goes much more in depth than just thinking from background to foreground. Two identifying the furthest plane and the first shape you are going to do. Third, identifying the average color value of that particular shape. I will explain what that is later on. And four, identifying the notorious shadows or the notorious highlights or notorious transitions of that shape if they exist. And these are uh, terms or tem terminology I created solely for this technique, so I don't use these for any other purpose. Then we come back to step 2, reload and repeat, and that's basically it. If you follow these steps, you can paint any subject from the simplest to the most complex, including things you never tried before. The objective of this technique is synthesis while helping you to sharpen your skills for color, lighting and shapes as well as building up your self-confidence as an artist. So let's see how we can put that into action. Take a print screen of our subject. This is a cropped version of a snapshot my only brother, who also happens to be my best friend, sent to me and kindly donated for this class. As usual, I did some quick color corrections so it would look closer to what we see in real life. For this exercise, I'd like you to use a hard edge brush and the reason is that if you are doing this technique for the first time, you will understand your shapes better, thus you will understand your learning process better. So our brush of choice for this class today is the Sergeant brush. So let's go to step one. Let's break down the planes of our image, always from the furthest to the closest one towards the viewer. So plane one is the background wall. Plane two, the begonia and the furthest petunia. Plane three, 
the petunia leaves and the flower on the back top. Uh, plane four, these two flowers on the side getting closer to the viewer. And plane five, the big flower that is um, the closest element we have. Step two, identifying the furthest plane and shape we will do. So we start with the background. But here we have um, the wall surfaces and some moose or mold growing on it. I'm not sure what to call it. So I start with the clean surface and only later I will add these organics growing on the wall. Step 3. Identifying the average color of our first shape. What do I mean by that? You can answer that by also answering the following questions. What color do I see as dominant in that shape or area? So here is all about your intuition and perceptions. In my case, I see a gray green. Then you are going to do the following process in that exact order. First, you are going to find a hue on the color wheel. Second, you are going to find a value range, how dark or how light in, um, this dominating color appears to be. So you get it at the average between the lightest and the darkest point. It's not something you need to measure, it's something you just go with your gut. And then three, find out how saturated this color appears to be. And don't worry if you don't get the right color at first because um, Sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to find it. So let's start painting. And remember to have the brush in full opacity and full resaturation for this process. And it takes me about three attempts to be satisfied with the color that I pick. So you keep on trying if you don't get it at first. It doesn't need to be perfect and I don't want you to use the color picker. I just want you to go intuitively. Also important to keep in mind, remember to make your shapes big enough so they can be overlapped as you progress in the painting. And we have a second dominating color on the wall, so we repeat the process. We find out the hue, we find the value range and the saturation range. To get these cool edges, I simply do some dabbing or very short brush strokes from left to right and right to left as opposed to doing strokes from top and down as those will make the um, those will make them have a sharp straight edge so we go to step 4 which is identifying the notorious shadows the notorious highlights or notorious transitions of that shape if they exist i say if they exist because they can be all the way from non-existent to super strong depending on the lighting condition and we will depict them only if they are notorious enough, if they really make a difference in the artwork, otherwise we skip them all together. In the case of this image, we have very soft shadows due to the overcast weather. In this wall, we have just a couple of small spots with shadows. To the left, they are more on a purple grey and to the right more on a dark blue, desaturated. Done that, we finish this part of the painting with the textures. You don't want to be very accurate here, you just want to give a gist, an idea that there are textures occurring on that wall. So it's a bit more nuanced work. However, notice that I use the same brush size and I'm mostly just dabbing. And by the way, along the process for this entire image, we will change the brush size only when really necessary. It's a minimalist way of working. You may have noticed that for this texturing, I am lowering the opacity of some layers. And I do that so we give a slight illusion of gradation as we see the underlying colors and shapes. We don't want to go full value range or do perfect shapes and gradients with this minimalist technique. We just want to give a simple illusion that we have these things covered. If you are not uh, happy with the edge or shape, one quick way to fix it is by color picking the surrounding colors 
and apply the new brush strokes to try to reshape your underlying brush strokes. That saves time from cropping, erasing, or changing a brush size. So let's add some new ones or a quick texturing to the blue areas. Do you remember the brush mechanics we used for the sergeant brush in our previous class? This entire painting is very similar, except we are not blending the colors by working in full resaturation and across multiple layers. Now we reload and repeat. What is the furthest unpainted plane? The areas marked in blue, so we start anywhere in those areas. I'd like to start with the Bergonia. We find the average color for each shape of the set. I'd like to mention that every time you paint the general shape of a new object or component of the artwork, make sure your layer stays in full opacity. Do we see any notorious transitions, highlights or shadows? Well, there are a few um, places where we see some highlights. and. Uh, some of the places where we see some shadows. We see some spots with some notorious shadows on the leaves and a few highlights on the flowers. In these cases, we lower the opacity of the layers to give the slight illusion of a gradation, like we did with the texturing on the wall. Let's not use more than two or three layers tops to make this illusion. And now we do a similar process with the flower to the right. Reload and repeat. Our furthest unpainted plane is the one marked in red now. I start with the flowers on the top back and finding the average color. Remember always following the three steps, finding the hue, finding the value range, finding the saturation. Now we move to the foliage, mostly a few variations of green. Then we check about the notorious transitions, highlights or shadows. Done that, we go to our fourth plane, and we find the average color value for these flowers. Because these petunias are a close-up, it's important that we show some of the subtle shading they have in this lighting condition. If they were not a close-up, we pretty much would do just the flat colors. We reload and repeat, going to the closest plane. It's mostly the average color for these shapes as well, with just some notorious shadows and a twist of transition, or gradient going from yellow to white. 
By the way, if you want to have straight edges for the color patterns of the flowers, you can do that as well. I particularly like these dabbed edges here. Now that we have come to the end of this sketch, it's time to take a look overall and see if there is any fixing or finishing you may want to add. I add one more layer in low opacity and hard light compositing mode to ice the cake. Give a bit extra depth on a soft shading. And a few small fixes on some shapes. Et voilà! Now that you know the steps, you can test this technique with different brushes of the sergeant set or any other set of your preference and you can see what happens. So just for fun, I did a little experiment with the liquid ink sketcher. So here's what you can do. Save your file as a new version, flatten the layers, duplicate the image. And also keep a copy um, just in case. So now you lower the resaturation completely to make a small burst size and in small circular strokes you can go blending the edges and the overall parts of the image. And be careful to alter the size of the brush strokes and direction so the effect doesn't look mechanical. You can leave it as it is or lower the opacity and have it interact with the original image you made, creating a softer, more painterly effect. These are other examples of minimalist realism sketch that I did with different brushes for an in-depth free online class, which you can access on the IAMAG Masterclasses website. So I recommend you watch that if you want to see how this technique applies gradually to more complex and different subjects, also different lighting conditions, among other things. You can access the full URL or simply go to videos.imag.co and search for Easy Souza. We have come to the end of our third class and you have learned how to break down color, lighting and shape into organized, manageable parts to work on any subjects. On our next class, you will learn how to increase the level of complexity of your sketches. Thank you so much for watching, Corel Painter and I hope this class has been helpful to you. Stay creative, stay positive and inspired.